Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Um, our group is an international collective made up of academics and postgraduate students as, as well as government and non-government researchers and, and a variety of other people who are interested in social capital. In this session, we welcome Professor Lyndon J. Robertson uh, for a conversation about the high cost of cheap social capital. Lyndon was a professor of agricultural and resource economics at Michigan State University from 1977 to this year. Um, he's recently retired. Here, he is co-author of an important 2002 publication, Is Social Capital Really Capital? And I'm sure most social capital researchers are familiar with that article. His pioneering research focuses on the role of social capital in establishing the terms of trade and levels of trade. His most recent publications describe social capital motives and distinguish between relational goods and commodities. In this session, we're going to start with a conversation between Lyndon and I, and then afterwards we'll open up the conversation to the wider audience and invite questions. If you think of questions as you go along, you can post them in the chat, and we also welcome you to, to say hello and indicate whereabouts in the world you're from, because we have a, an incredibly diverse audience here. So, Lyndon, um, when you first started using the term social capital in, in the mid-1980s, um, the term was almost virtually unknown. I think at the time, there was maybe a handful of different people in the world who were using the term, but no one really knew what it meant. It wasn't part of, of, of our common language. Um, so I'm really interested in how you actually came to, be, came to become interested in the term social capital. Well, thank you, Tristan. And Hello to everyone who's online. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to participate, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Um, Kristen, you've asked how I came to be interested in social capital, and of course, um, I didn't have any concept of the term when, when it began, but I, I was on sabbatic leave in 1984 and 85 at Brigham Young University, and I was, um, I had two, two interests. Uh, one was that uh, I wanted to explain economics to members of my faith. And as I tried to do so, I couldn't really rationalize um, sort of faith concepts like caring, sharing, and serving with the uh, rational choice theory or neoclassical economics that focused on maximizing your utility from consumption or maximizing profit if you're a producer. And so I basically gave up trying to rationalize sort of faith concepts with uh, my neoclassical background in economics. And when I returned from sabbatic leave to Michigan State, I faced a little bit of a dilemma, which was do I continue uh, emphasizing the neoclassical economics, which really didn't explain a lot of behavior that, that I saw and, and recommended with what I was teaching. And so that led to a, an interdisciplinary group with some support from the provost. We began trying to understand the concept or what uh, the, the essence of relationship from several different points of view representing several different disciplines. My colleague at that time, Marcelo Silas, was instrumental in helping this effort. So uh, after some time uh, working on trying to understand relationships, I was visiting with a colleague and I told him what we were interested in. And I said, but we don't know what to call it. And he said, well, uh, why don't you call it social capital? It's social and it has, uh, capital-like concepts. And I said, gee, what a great idea. We'll call it social capital. And then later uh, realized the stars had aligned and, and this had been a longstanding concept and people like uh, 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 Portes and Bordeaux and, and Coleman and Putnam and so many people were thinking about the same thing. So um, from that time, it just almost consumed my attention. And at the end, my family was begging, please don't talk about this anymore. Can we talk about something else? Uh, 
So you really started with um, a problem that you wanted to address. There was, there was basically a deficiency or, or you know something you wanted to solve, and you were working on that for probably quite a while, I imagine, before you stumbled upon the term or you came up with the term social capital. And I think a lot of people these days probably uh, experience a similar kind of thing. I, I know myself, uh, we were talking before the session, um, I had a similar sort of challenge that I wanted to solve and I eventually stumbled acro across the term social capital. I mean, for me, I didn't come up with it. It, it was something that I could read in, in other people's work in, in 2002. Um, but for you, it was something that you really needed to come up with yourself and you needed to start to develop based around a particular um, problem that you saw. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in um, the problem you saw seems to be within economic theorizing. Would that be accurate, do you think? Yes. Um, if you think of sort of rational choice as being maximizing the um, satisfaction you receive from um, your commodities and, and, and other investment, uh, it really leads you to a selfishness of preference approach. And uh, yet what I saw and, and what I hope practice was a, an interest in sort of acting in a way that accounted for the well-being of others. And so uh, the question was, how do I maintain this rational choice approach while at the same time allowing for the interests of others to affect my, my decision? And really a, a breakthrough for us was, uh, came from the writings of Adam Smith and of course, uh, you know that he wrote the theory of moral sentiments before he wrote the, um, his book on the wealth of nations. And he made this very interesting statement, which was, uh, however selfish, uh, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So <clears throat> there was, this was really an important concept for us because it said, we really internalize the well-being of others. And in that process, we derive something. And we've come to call that a relational good that, that satisfies some social emotional needs. So if I were to trace I guess the definition that I've adopted to uh, to someplace it would be to Adam Smith. Yeah, all the way back really to the to the um, start of economics as a discipline, or even before economics started as a discipline. And it seems, from an outsider, I'm, I'm not an economist, but from an outsider, it seems like the original work of, of Adam Smith focusing on um, uh, basically self-interest, that was the part that was taken up by the economic discipline um, in the following centuries and sort of ignored or overlooked the sympathy component, which also is, is what social capital is all about, seems to be a really important component. So here we are, you know, 1980s, um, bringing back in sympathy, which was really there from the very beginning with Adam Smith. That's really a nice, a nice summary statement of what has happened. Um, I think in fairness to Adam Smith, the word uh, empathy wasn't around when he wrote his first chapter in his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which he titled Sympathy. We would probably more accurately refer to it as empathy now. And yes, that's exactly where I'm at, trying to bring sympathy or empathy, trust or regard back in to a, sort of a rational choice model, because I, I, I do believe that offers really a great perspective for our studying behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see how, um, as an economist, you would want to bring that back in because it's kind of seen as being missing or absent from it. And I think for other social scientists as well, um, they feel like uh, this focus on empathy or sympathy, a focus on the importance of relationships has become missing in, in modern society in the way we go about doing a lot of things. So I think for everybody, really, the motivation is to, to re-emphasize the importance of relationships and, and that missing component. 
Um, and it's really, I think, the, the strength and the, the influence of economics throughout the, the 20th century, particularly, that has led to really all, sci all social scientists feeling the need for, for a concept like social capital. And perhaps that's why it's so incredibly popular across virtually all of the social sciences, as we know it is, is now. I, I couldn't agree more. And I guess what, what has really um, altered my way of thinking is to recognize that um, if economics is focused on exchanges and the terms and level of trade and the selection of trading partners, that we're really trading really two kinds of goods. One, commodities, which satisfy our physical needs, but also something we call relational goods, which satisfy our need for internal and external validation and a sense of belonging and, and um, and so all interactions really can include both. I have a little analogy that I uh, sometimes like to use. And that is when you buy an airline ticket, I can pay with money or I can pay with frequent flyer miles, sometimes one, sometimes the other. So if I were to compare money to commodities and frequent flyer miles to relational goods, uh, when I'm exchanging, um, have an exchange with a person, both of those kind of things may be exchanged. And why that is so important is in my case, when I couldn't understand or explain from a neoclassical perspective, what was the essence of an exchange? It was because I was ignoring the component of relational goods that sometimes we do things exclusively for relational goods and other times they form part of the exchange. So for me, that really became a key to trying to explain a wide variety of exchanges that economists typically ignore. Yeah, and I can understand why sympathy or empathy is so important because if, if I'm selling an item to a, to a friend, I'm, I'm likely to sell it for much less than it's worth. Um, and so the, that's just a very simple example of the benefits of basically what we call social capital. I'm also far more likely to, to want to engage with that friend, to, to exchange with that, that person because of, of the feelings of sympathy, empathy, and, and so forth that I might have with that person. So that's really the heart of social capital, isn't it? At least from my perspective. Um, I, I have one interesting anecdote because you raised the idea of selling a, a used car, um, assuming we're not selling new cars, but... Um, uh, the very first study that we did was on finding the uh, minimum sell price for a used car. And so we did this exhaustive study and, and found that if you're selling it to a friend, particularly uh, someone who's sort of down and out economically, many times you give it away or sell it for a very low price and hardly anyone will, or to a, a stranger, you sell it at the market price. But if you're selling it to a, a nasty neighbor, you charge a premium, which at the end of the day means nasty neighbors never buy your car. So we, we wrote this up and, and sent it into an econ meeting and the reviewer came back and said, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not economic, so go someplace else. We showed it to some friends in sociology and they said, you economists are so out of it. Only you would think you had to study this. The rest of us just knew it with, you know, as a matter of fact. So I think that was a harbinger of the response this work was going to get. Yeah, absolutely. Ever since then, we've applied it to um, um, all kinds of things. And uh, if I could just use one more example. Uh, one of the questions that was always asked uh, was, how do you measure the importance of social capital in exchanges? And uh, which was a very relevant question. And the answer is you find a standard and the standard against which you measure exchanges was strangers trading a commodity. So uh, in, I think an important study in which we examine land prices, farmland prices, uh, we would ask, what discount would you offer to a friend uh, 
compared to the arm's length market price. And we did that across five states. And that became sort of a metric that we could say a relationship, since that was the only thing we were varying, resulted in a discount in price. And the other thing that was interesting, at least 22% of the people said they wouldn't sell their land for anything because it had been in their family for generations. They had a kind of a commitment to their um, ancestors to maintain it. And that, that was, they weren't going to sell it. Yeah, right. Well, uh, we're going to be talking about cheap social capital, but before we move on to that, shall we talk about your definition of social capital? Fairly briefly, we could talk about definition all day. So, so what is your definition of social capital? Well, um, you might expect this coming from the tradition of Adam Smith, that we define social capital as sympathy, empathy, trust and regard one person or group has for another person or group who are the object of their social capital. So um, for us, the definition of social capital really um, has as its origin as, uh, Adam Smith and his concept of sympathy or empathy. And it's so important for us because that allows us to um, sort of act in a rational choice way and include the um, well-being of others in our choices. And I think it's really important. I'm sure a lot of the audience right now is thinking deeply about that definition because there are so many other different definitions of social capital that exist. And so to highlight the important points here, I think that you know, by focusing on sympathy and, and empathy, because they're very related concepts, um, we're, we're really focusing on how people think, how they feel in relation to others. And I think that's the most important point. It's in relation to an, another person or another group. And that's really the most important point of this, de this definition, this, this conceptual approach to social capital. Go ahead, and then. So I might just sort of hop to the net to a related point, which is we're talking about relationships, and and what what exactly are we talking about? I mean, what what leads to a relationship? And early on, we recognize that a relationship begins with with what two or more people have in common, and we can sort of what which we call commonalities. And these can be either things that uh, are inherited from birth, such as your genealogy, your age, your gender, nationality, language, so many things that we inherit at birth, which we call inherited or, um, uh, or ascribed. Or the other um, um, kind of commonality are those earned or achieved. Now, um, Robert Putnam talks about the commonality of, of being in a civic organization, a church group, a bowling league, and so on, uh, that would be an example of an earned commonality for us. Now, the difference uh, between those uh, is that it leads to uh, two different kinds, at least two different kinds of social capital. One of them that is more transactional, uh, really reflected in activities that you're mutually engaged in, and we call that the um, linking social capital. And the more intense that are more permanent uh, because uh, they're inherited, they can't be changed, you can't destroy them and so on. We refer to bonding social capital and, and they account for exchanges of mostly relational goods. Now, there may be a third category of strong ties based on um, uh, based on covenants and commitments uh, that might be someplace in between. Um, so it's these commonalities that help us distinguish between sort of um, bonding and linking social capital. Of course, there's bridging social capital, which is asymmetric um, kind of commonalities. But um, there's been some discussion about that. For us, this distinction uh, has to has to be consistent with our our concept of commonalities. <laughs> 
So, so digging into commonalities, um, when you have a commonality with somebody, this is really a source then of, of, of empathy or sympathy, isn't it? It's like a... Yes, absolutely. Uh, your point is really well made that if I can come to understand and we share some experiences, we can relate to things that we both feel and understand. We're in agreement. We're likely to find um, uh, sort of common sympathies and and experiences. Um, an interesting book on tribes talks about the uh, the deep bond that develop among soldiers in conflict, which would be an example. So, um, or members of the same team. That it, it's really something that I think most of us can relate to. That that our 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 social capital really the source of it be, was some kind of commonality. Or should we get into cheap social capital? Because I think a lot of the challenges with social capital as a concept is that it implies that there are positive outcomes. But of course, relationships uh, cover the, the full spectrum you know, from positive to negative. And, and where you have commonalities, you have, have differences as well. So, so what's the concept of cheap social capital? Thank you for that question. Um, if you think of relationships on a spectrum, if at the far right, we have social capital, which is sympathy, empathy, trust, and regard. There must be something at the other end, which is lack of sympathy, antipathy, fear, disdain, and so on, that it would be hard to imagine that one uh, existed without the other. And just to make the point in the middle without either is uh, strangers trading commodities, which is the focus of neoclassical economics. So uh, we were interested in, is um, cheap social capital relevant? Is it, could we find examples? And uh, sort of a quote that, that caught my attention was one by the famous economist, Kenneth Boulding, in which he compared um, the love and hate. He said, in love with a longer pull than hate, is slow indeed to propagate. And so um, we thought that, you know, this probably was an important concept. The question was, could we, could we find, uh, could we define it? And could we find examples of it? So uh, coming to the definition of cheap social capital, it's simply the opposite of social capital. It's lack of sympathy, antipathy, fear, and disdain. So think of those as just simply two polar opposites definition. But before, uh, if I can just make one more point on this, if you're a member of a cheap social capital, you have access to tremendous benefits. Uh, you have favorable terms of trade, externalities are internalized in your group, you share information, you support institutions, so many things that we, we ascribe to um, as with our membership in the cheap in the social capital network. But what about those who are not members of the social capital network? They're denied all of the advantages of being part of that network. And, um, and what develops as a result of this exclusion or discrimination is what some have called the dark side of social capital. Uh, simply the disadvantages of a social capital network. So uh, I think I want to acknowledge that uh, in some circles, at least, we, we recognize that social capital isn't necessarily uh, a, a, an unmitigated good. <laughs> Absolutely. So like the term social capital implies positive, I guess we could have addressed this problem by trying to come up with a term that, that suggests the negative social disadvantage or social, I don't know, don't know what the word would be, but you've, you've chosen the word cheap. Um, so I'm interested in why you consider cheap social capital to be cheap. <laughs> well, first of all, it makes a great seminar title. <laughs> and so uh, you know, some of you out there may, may have joined us simply because what in the world is, is a cheap social capital? So um, there are at least three reasons why we call cheap social capital cheap. And I'm going to go back to um, Adam Smith again, who explained a very important concept 
which he referred to as the paradox of value. And he said, water, which is essential to survival, is less expensive, I'll say cheap, relative to diamonds, which are not nearly as important. And of course, uh, the reason, the explanation is water is so much more abundant than diamond. So the first reason that cheap social capital is cheap is because uh, it's so easily accessed. Anyone who is a stranger can be the object of your cheap social capital. You don't have any commonalities with them. Or anyone who is different can be the object of your cheap social capital. Or anyone who has thwarted your achievement of a goal can be um, an object of your cheap social capital. And, and so you develop this um, lack of sympathy, antipathy, and so on toward this object. But the second reason it's cheap is when you build a network on the basis of a shared commonality, which is we both hate the same object, that relationship is different than the kind of relationship in a social capital network. It's strange, we call that strange bedfellows, people cooperating even though they have nothing in common. We call that just, that's strange. And because it's strange, it doesn't produce the same kind of relational goods and cooperation and so on that you expect from a social capital network. So, uh, and the third reason is that it has very low maintenance cost. Um, we can hold the grudge from almost anyone um, that uh, without doing anything, you know, we can hold on to um, the Hatfield and the McCoys as an example, but enemies can last forever. You know, friends require uh, sort of constant maintenance. You've got to call them up, you've got to visit them. So in terms of maintenance costs, cheap social capital is really cheap. Yeah, so there's, there's sayings like um, the friend of my friend is, is a friend, um, the enemy yeah. of my enemy is a friend. <laughs> or is a strange bedfellow. Yeah, the enemy perhaps a, is a yeah. strange bedfellow, I'm not sure. Um, he or she qualifies as a friend, but, but certainly you've established a connection. And that's exactly the point of cheap social capital, really, isn't it? Because the enemy of my enemy isn't a, isn't a true friend. Like you, you would be prepared to work with them, cooperate with them, work towards collective goals with them, but they're, they're not a friend. They don't, you don't have the same kinds of relational goods with them that you would with a friend. You know, strange bedfellow is probably the right kind of term to describe that. You're... Uh, Indeed, because um, this um, cheap social capital network is fragile. All, all that we need to do is for the object of our cheap social capital to form a relationship with a member of our network, and now we've lost our network. So the a cheap social capital network can be um, really fragile as the alliances in World War II. Uh, it started with an alliance between the Soviet Union and Germany, that broke down and then a new alliance formed with the allied power. So we have lots and lots of examples of um, the fragility of a cheap social capital network. Yeah, I just want to emphasize again for everybody that it's it's really the the cheap social capital is so cheap because it's so easy to build. You know, it's so easy to create division, to create you know an us and them kind of situation where you can vilify some other group or some other individual, and then you you can then um, have. Uh, cooperation, collaboration, you know, things that look like social capital occurring against this other person or group, um, but it, it's not the same as, as, as real social capital, as, as something that is positive and productive. I think, you know, for me, that's the most important point that I take out of, of cheap social capital and an understanding of it. And it, it seems so absolutely crucial to, well, everything really that happens around the world. You, you see it everywhere you look. I mean, what are some examples that you see? So when we started, we, um, one, we wondered, okay, how, um, how difficult is it going to be to find examples of cheap social capital? And then once we started looking, we felt like fish discovering water, that uh, um, every place we looked, uh, political divisions, alliances, sports, literature, um, it, it, it was just almost impossible to turn someplace where you didn't find 
um, an example of relationships being formed on the basis of cheap social capital. Yesterday, I was at my uh, granddaughter's soccer game and immediately the poor referee became the object of cheap social capital for any number of fans. So, uh, usually the one team that's losing seems to be more intent, but uh, we practice it every day. In fact, I, I have to sort of monitor my own behavior and say, am I trying to create a cheap social capital network by gossiping about someone? emphasizing their <laughs> bad qualities. And, and so it, it does, it's a concept that requires some internal introspection, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about why cheap social capital is cheap, um, but the title of, of this session is The High Cost of Cheap Social Capital. So, so why is cheap social capital so costly? So, um, you know, when I started studying this, I, I really asked myself the question, am I doing anybody a favor by naming and, and trying to emphasize this concept? Because, um, uh, you know, I, I think, wouldn't we just like to focus on sort of positive things? And the, the, the problem is that there's, it's costly because it reduces the average level of social capital, of relational goods, of the production of commodities, the distribution of commodities, it leads to so many undesirable outcomes that I think to sort of defend ourselves, we, we have to say, yes, it is costly because it produces really bad outcomes. Now, social capital, you can say, produces some good outcomes. And I suppose you could say that in the case of cheap social capital, that maybe you need cheap social capital for a country to come together in war, to unite against a common enemy, that there may be some of those kind of, of benefits. But by and large, it's costly because it reduces everybody's well-being in one way or another. Yeah, it, it seems like the, the net benefit, if you look at everybody involved, um, the people, the, the cheap social capital network, as well as the, um, the object of that cheap social capital, the, you know, who they're um, uniting against, basically. Overall, then it must be worse off. You know, the net result must be maybe the same, but worse, because certain actions are being taken that are are not cooperative or collaborative or don't promote trade and exchange and uh, you know helpful behavior overall. So there may be some net positives within the cheap social capital group. I mean, there has to be, that's why they do it. But overall, it seems like maybe it, it's, it's not going to be positive. So we talked about social capital is important because it produces relational goods that satisfy sort of deep, uh, you know, recognized social emotional needs for validation and, and uh, internal and external and belonging and so on. Um, it, cheap social capital must have value because it satisfies some needs. It, it must satisfy uh, a need for uh, internal validation because I can even a score, I can beat up on someone, and therefore I feel better about myself. Um, I'm popular when I pick on the poor kid, you know, other people applaud me. Um, I can make people, I can decommodify people. I can make people who are the source of social capital into a commodity or even less than a commodity. And once I've achieved that, I can take all kinds of advantage of them. I can sell them inferior products. I can lie to them. I can do uh, so on. So we get the same basic motivations from cheap social capital as we get for social capital, but they just lead to much different outcomes. Yeah, and it sounds like quite a lot of those outcomes can be negative for, for some individuals, even the, even the, not just the object, but even the, the, the owners, if you like, the people involved in the cheap social capital network can have some disadvantage. I, I really believe that, that the social emotional needs that are satisfied from creating cheap social capital. I, I, I really suspect that, that they really are valuable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Should we should we dive into some some observations? Because I think these things will become much clearer when we start talking about some of these examples. So, so where would you like to start with the, the observations? So uh, what we um, what we assembled or what we tried to uh, produce was sort of some common observation that people observed as a consequence of people acting on their cheap social capital. And this was kind of a, a, a new line of research. Uh, uh, while social capital produced uh, a lot of explanation for what um, Richard Thaler called uh, um, predictably irrational choices or, or uh, misbehaving, uh, Dan Arroyoli as well. Um, we find lots of behavior that can be explained by cheap social capital that you really can't explain any other way. So let's consider the first one. If you're going to create uh, cheap social capital, the first thing that you need is an object. And of course, Machiavelli talks about uh, advice for an unpopular ruler is to start a war. Well, the unpopular military junta in um, Argentina thought that would be a good idea to solidify their um, uh, support. So they created the Falklands War. They uh, claimed that what uh, they led to a dispute between Great Britain and Argentina. Let's create the, the object of, of cheap social capital. Anyway, it turned out really well for the conservative government in Great Britain that uh, their popularity really rose quite, quite well after they defeated Argentina in the Falklands War. So that's the first one. And the research question is, um, as cheap social capital toward an unpopular object increases, uh, does the solidarity um, of the cheap social capital network increase? So you can think of uh, gangs uh, create solidarity in their membership by, by attacking an, uh, an object. In fact, membership may require that you join in that. The second, uh, the second observation... Before we move on to the, to the second one, Lyndon, I just thought I might propose a, another example that might be relevant for observation mm -hmm. one um, and see, see, get your thoughts on it. Um, so those in Australia would be familiar about 20 years ago, um, the Tampa uh, was a big political scandal that happened. And what, what it was, was um, some, some refugees uh, were trying to cross to Australia from, from Indonesia um, and they ran into some problems with their fishing boat and a Norwegian cargo ship called the Tampa, picked them up, um, basically saved them from drowning um, and then entered Australian waters to, to um, basically get them, unload them. Um, the Australian government refused. Um, John Howard was the pr uh, prime minister at the time uh, and basically turned this event into a, a scandal, um, basically called these people um, uh, boat people, uh, labelled them as being, um, you know, queue jumpers, um, and really created a what I think is a, a cheap social capital object out of uh, refugees who are seeking asylum in Australia um, and basically went on to win his third term and probably even his fourth term um, in power and really um, galvanised the Australian public into support for this kind of policy, you know, border protection policy. Um, and then some polls indicated at the time that maybe as much as 90% of the Australian public supported these kinds of measures. Um, so basically blew this, this situation into a, you know, a huge, um, huge problem that wasn't really ever much of a problem to start with. And I think that, to me, that sounds like an example of cheap social capital. What do you think? Um, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about a similar experience in, um, in the past election, not the most recent one, but the, uh, the earlier one, in which... Um, I think um, the Trump campaign made Mexican immigrants the object of cheap social capital. I, I just have a quote from, um, from one of Donald Trump's speeches. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people who have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs, bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. And so 
um, that that was the the Mexican uh, migrants became the object of cheap social capital, and that leads me to the second observation that when you form a cheap social capital, you invest in defensive and destructive investments that really result in substitution from other more productive goods. So I, I have a, a, a little statistic here, said the president proposed building a thousand miles of wall, but he uh, revised that figure down to 450. It had uh, 40 contracts to 15 countries, uh, $10 billion to build his portion of the wall. So uh, uh, making defensive and destructive investments is the, usually the natural consequence of uh, building, of creating a cheap social capital object. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Tristan. Oh yeah, it seems just like where um, in the first observation um, it produces solidarity, and I think you know the example of the Tampa, ninety percent of the Australian population supporting it produced solidarity, and it certainly produced solidarity around John Howard's attempt for re-election. And um, the same is probably true here that to maintain that sort of solidarity, you, you do you're, you're inclined to to protect it. You're inclined to to, to make spending on on defensive measures. And I think maybe another example of this is, um, you know, there's been some documented um, analysis that if we spent 3% of, of our military spending on ending hunger, uh, you know, we could do so just 3% of military spending. And that comes out to something like 26 hours worth of, of US military spending alone um, would so solve world hunger. So we can certainly see how some of these um, defensive or, or destructive um, spendings are, are being, um, you know, could be put to better use or different use that could be more productive. So it certainly is a good example. So, um... If I could add another observation, it would be that um, when we um, when we want to disadvantage the object of our cheap social capital, one popular way to do that is by changing the rules. Then these rules disadvantage um, the object of our cheap social capital. Um, historically, in the U.S., one one unhappy example is um, following the uh, Civil War, we adopted, or many Southern states adopted what we refer to as the uh, Black Laws, or the, I suppose there are different names for them, which was that um, any Black person without proper documentation or um, explanation of their behavior loitering could be arrested and then um, leased to uh, plantations or, or other large organizations. And it, I think I have a statistic here in um, 18 or in, um, uh, in 1898, 73% of Alabama's entire annual state revenue came from convict leasing. Well, a more recent example in the United States is that uh, yeah, that 389 voter reg restrictive bills have been presented in 48 start states because we want to change the rules on who gets to vote. So some really egregious examples of wanting to change institutions to disadvantage our, uh, the objects of our cheap social capital. I think it's a really important example, the role of institutions and something I think comes up quite often when we're, we're talking about social capital. And I wanted to put forward another example for your comment as well, which was in Germany prior to World War II, the Nazis changed a lot of the institutions to very specifically and deliberately disadvantaged Jews. Um, and so one example was the university system uh, in 1933 the Nazis actually prevented, made it illegal for Jews to be on campus, uh, and they basically fired any uh, Jewish professors um, without pay, just immediately ended their, their tenure. Uh, and what it led to was about 15% of all university teachers left by the fall of 1933. And they weren't all Jewish, of course. There was other, other people who left as a result of, of these kinds of policies. 
And one of the most notable, I think, was actually Albert Einstein, who left and finished out his career in, in Princeton, um, really as a result of this Nazi policy. So it seems like that's an example of, of institutions changing the rules to disadvantage the object of their, the cheap social capital. Absolutely. That's a wonderful example. Um, if I could, uh, earlier I talked about what motivates us to um, develop cheap social capital. And one motivation is economics. Um, if I decommodify a group and can, uh, I can adopt um, tactics and procedures that disadvantage them without any compunction. And, uh, and we, which makes you um, really appreciate those um, businesses that really have a sense of obligation to their customers and to develop a, a, a safe product. But in one case, which has been uh, so widely discussed and its consequences so predictively um, egregious, was the tobacco companies in uh, the early 50s. Uh, it was pretty well known, or at least not known publicly, that tobacco uh, smoking had um, widely uh, created a lot of health problems. And um, yet uh, we continued to uh, promote um, smoking I've, I've read some advertisements where it said it was good for your throat. Um, and it also introduced um, uh, an interesting application of social capital. And that is, if you take a public figure who has a lot of social capital, in other words, a lot of people respect, admire, and so on, and that person associates with the product, this product acquires what we refer to as attachment value. The, value and the meaning of the object changes. And so here's an advertisement with John Wayne, who is a very famous actor smoking, uh, I think, camels. And, um, and so to be like John Wayne, you, you smoke camel. One, one really good example of creating attachment value it comes from the movie Castaway, in which Tom Hanks is uh, stranded on a deserted island and um, there's a ball that, uh, that he makes, he creates attachment value for the ball and uh, it becomes an important item for him when he leaves. So uh, I, I think when I, when I buy a used car from a stranger, um, I, I often wonder, um, am I the object of your cheap social capital? Is there any, do you, do you internalize my well-being? Will you sell me a something faulty, um, you know, when, that, when we were concerned in, in our current health situation with obesity and we look at all the sugary drinks and corn syrup products and so on. We have to worry about our consumers really being treated as objects of cheap social capital having been decommodified. Yeah, and perhaps another example is the, the opioid crisis in the United States particularly. You know, um, I think it was only in October last year that one of the major pharmaceutical companies was was actually um, had to had to uh, engage in a massive settlement. I think it was about eight billion dollars or something, um, and admit wrongdoing um, in their profiteering in relation to um, prescribing opioids to people who basically they ended up overdosing and and dying as a result of, of this. You know, all for basically for profit. Seems like an example. Yes, a perfect example. Um, I, uh, I'm, I, I'm noticing the time, Tristan. We we have um, lots of of examples um, of um, of the the consequences of creating cheap social capital, but one is uh, observed in our current political um, crisis, at least in the United States, and I suspect in other places as well where um, candidates for office have made each other not a, 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 a loyal opposition. They've really made them um, cheap social capital objects. I mean, 
phrases like lock her up and, and other um, really um, sort of degrading comments um, seem an extreme form of um, creating cheap social capital. And, um, and, and I think uh, what, what it's led to, at least in the Congress of the United States, is an inability to cooperate on anything in the middle. And uh, this has acquired a lot of research attention, but in, in this slide, if you compare the blue and the red and uh, talk about their platforms, you can see how separated they become from 1994 to 2014. What, mean, what this means is it's almost impossible to get bipartisan agreement on, on hardly anything. And so we have gridlock, and, which has disadvantaged us all. Um, if I could uh, add one more that, I, that I, uh, I'm sensitive to is um, there was a famous quote that said, when war comes, when war comes, the first casualty is truth. So if, if I have someone that I oppose and, and want to disadvantage, a readily apparent means um, is to tell mistruths about them. And you can think of some really uh, famous um, statements that turned out to be less than true, such as the presence of uh, weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq, the Gulf of Tonkin event, um, just lots and lots of, of, of mistruths or uh, sort of distorted truths that have had profound and disastrous consequences. Absolutely, and I think um, talking about that, Bob Putnam, when he gave his webinar back in, in May of this year, he talked about the, the polarization in the United States and he actually showed a graph that showed it increasing from around about 1890, 1900, um, the, it, the polarization decreased uh, through the 50s and 60s and then increased again to where we are today. And, and his interest, uh, Bob Putnam's interest, is in that those, those broad historic changes over time and their correlation with a range of other factors like um, inequality and, and those kinds of things. So it's, it's, it certainly seems like political parties are able to um, get cheap runs on the board, if you like, cheap social capital by creating this division. They can, they can mobilise support, solidarity, and all of these things we've been talking about very, very quickly. But there are, of course, these costs, as you've been talking about, these costs that then come as a result of, of using that kind of strategy. Uh, I, I have a slide here that was uh, requested uh, to be shown again, which is compares we have this marvelous fact checker industry uh, that uh, follows most, most political candidates and checks their statements. And so one comparison is the number of mistruths and, and truths from uh, comparing Obama, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, Joe Biden. And it turns out that Obama was fairly truthful he, by, by quite, a, quite a stretch. Uh, Donald Trump, much less so, um, in fact, and, and finally, Joe Biden, which is somewhere in, in the middle. So um, I guess if we were to sort of talk about uh, how to reduce the, the, the sort of negative consequence of cheap social capital, we would emphasize making truth more transparent. Yeah. Well, shall we, shall we move on to, to the next uh, stage um, in the interests of time? Um, so I guess, you know, what, can we, what can we do about it? What, how can we mitigate these costs? You've already started talking about that, but what are some ideas that you have? Well, um, I mean, the most obvious one is simply refuse to make others the object of your cheap social capital. And uh, we've had some really wonderful historic examples of, uh, and even recent examples of, of people, uh, important people simply refusing to make uh, uh, people the object of their cheap social capital. And the campaign between um, Obama uh, early, early on, um, he, his, his, his opponent um, 
was was asked, well, Obama isn't really, he's an era, made some, and particularly um, un, uncomplimentary comments. And he took the microphone and simply said, uh, that is not true. That's not true. He's a fine family man and um, an opportunity that could have been uh, used to build cheap social capital. He refused to take it. And, um, and it's interesting that um, they became very good friends afterwards. So, so the first thing is simply refuse. Um, and, and, and I suppose there's a very, uh, you know, a sort of traditional story of the hero's journey. And uh, the, the hero, uh, heroine has many obstacles and so on, but in the end is successful because they make changes. Uh, they, they make internal changes. And, and so I, I think we can simply say, let's, let's refuse to um, so rapidly make people the object of, of our cheap social capital, I think. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the, the, the goal of, of a lot of, of nearly every major religion is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, simply not create a society in which organizations focus on cheap social capital objects. And of course, um, another would simply be to, to establish formal institutions that apply equally to everyone. And um, so that everyone has the same right. To, you know, we talk about the Bill of Rights and so on. When one group is disadvantaged by by specialized institution that they are particularly disadvantaged, um, we really open the door for, for cheap social capital. I heard a, a story in our in our in the sporting world that um, that after hockey matches, you know, in which people just were really quite unkind to each other, that they established the tradition of shaking hands afterwards as a tent to say, okay, let's not let this become long-term. Well, there are several examples um, that we could, we could talk to. Um, one would be to establish sort of universal commonalities. Can you imagine the consequence if everyone was required to provide universal service for a year or something, everyone, you couldn't buy out of it. And, these could be uh, in a number of ways, any, any number of activities, but simply we all had this commonality that we spent a year providing service to sort of disadvantaged groups. I think there was an example in the great, in the depression in the United States of, uh, of uh, CCC camps and, and other groups whose goal was simply to provide service. So I think there's lots of things we can do I think the first thing we have to recognize is it's really a dangerous thing and a costly thing, and we need to take it serious. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can see that. And it really does seem like it's a choice. that it, It's an easy path or, you know, it's cheap. You know, we can get benefit from it potentially, but it's at the expense of, of others. Um, and so it really it does seem like it's a, it's a choice that we all individually need to make to focus more towards, um, you know, moral standing towards all others. And it makes me really wonder whether your very original point about coming to this from you know, a religious standpoint and that neoclassical economics didn't really quite fit into religious beliefs, whether or not religion actually plays an important role moving forward as well. So uh, one of the concerns is that if we make, if we take caring and sharing and service and we remove that from individual exchanges and exchanges between service clubs and religions and so on, we really have removed an important source of building commonalities and developing social capital, and maybe even uh, sort of dis disabling a lot of these organizations which were such an important source of building social capital and reducing the costly consequence of cheap social capital. So we need those kind of sort of grassroots groups and religious groups and service clubs and so on to have an important place in our society and our system of exchanges that we we don't we don't we're not creating 
a wonderful advantage by making everything an arm's length transaction. Because when you have these local groups, they're delivering um, relational goods along with the commodities. I mean, I can, I can get a, um, you know, a, a dinner at an arm's length, but it's not the same as a family dinner, even though the food is the same. So it would be helpful to, to sort of maybe take down a notch our emphasis on arm's length institutions. Absolutely. I think like this, it's cheap social capital, this whole idea, this way of thinking about social capital. I think it, it permeates all aspects of our life and our activities. And we could keep talking about this for a very long time. Are there any final thoughts you want to share before we start opening it up to questions? Just one and responding to a note that came on the screen is, um, you know, if I have a car, I can... Uh, drive my family to a movie, or I can use it as a getaway car after we rob a bank. So there's nothing inherently um, about a group that means that the, all the things they produce are going to be social capital building or cheap social capital building. And unfortunately, a religion has played a major role over the history of mankind in creating cheap social capital. Of course, you know, we hope that's the exception, but we have to acknowledge that all of these groups have the capacity to, to do one or the other. Um, no, I just um, uh, appreciate, uh, perhaps as a final comment, um, this exchange with you, Tristan. It's really been a pleasure, social capital building to, uh, to get to know you even, even virtually. And so I'm very much appreciative of this opportunity. I welcome any comments or questions from our, our, our listeners. Yeah, thanks very much, Lyndon. And I feel much the same way about you. I've, we've only known each other for, well, a couple of months and we've only met a couple of times, but you feel like an old friend already. So it's been really wonderful having this conversation with you and engaging on all of this. So, so let's open it up for questions. Um, Marion, would you be able to help to guide us to the first question in the chat? Um, and also people feel free to put up your hand if you want to ask a question and we can get to it that way um, or place additional questions in the chat as well. So, so Marion, who's first up? Um, David's first up, hopefully. Um, and uh, I've asked people to you know, put their screens on if they can, but anyway. So I've been trying to guide it in the background, Tristan, but the first question comes from David, and I'm just trying to find him. David Williams? <laughs> yes, David Williams. Yep, good morning, everyone. Um, um, thank you very much, uh, Lyndon, for your, for your presentation this morning. Uh, a few comments you were making there seemed as quite an overlap with game theory as well, uh, which is, you know, uh, um, very much based in economics about how um, uh, players will actually manipulate the situation to for their own benefit. Do you see that there's an overlap here? Yes. Yeah, so if you if you think about some of the games, let's say Prisoner's Dilemma or Dictator Games and so on, and you conduct a study and you look at the results. If you allow those participants to share, let's say just a half an hour getting to know each other, you can produce quite different results uh, in the outcome of these games. So, um, and of course, uh, authority figures can also impose their consequences. So, so yes, um, the idea of social capital or cheap social capital is relevant to game theory. And I think we've demonstrated it in a number of ways. I'd be interested in your your comment if you have some. So, is it, do you think that this is a uh, potentially using um, cheap social capital as a, a way of converting the game from being uh, competitive to cooperative? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure that if you establish cheap social capital between participants, you could derive outcomes that would be very destructive and reduce, and, and in fact, that would be an interesting experiment that could you reduce the overall winnings of a particular game by creating cheap social capital among the participants. That would be a wonderful research project. I hope you'll do it. Thank you. 
maybe that's an important point here as well, that uh, Lyndon has proposed a, a, a range of different research questions that people might like to explore. Um, you know, Lyndon is, is re has retired and perhaps won't be progressing some of these, these research questions. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here to explore this. Um, and a lot of connections to things like game theory and, and other theories that exist, because like we've been talking about, social capital isn't really anything new. It's just a different lens or a different way of thinking about similar kinds of issues um, that have been explored in, in other ways. So should we move on to the next question, Marion? Who was next? Um, well, Ike was asking a question about uh, can we measure social capital like social, like capital stock in economics? Um, and I'm not too sure if they're still here. So, but anyway, so. Well, do you, is general question about measurement then, really? Measurement, yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on that one, Lyndon? Sure. So if we're going to have a race, we have to have a common, we have to have a common standard, common starting point, place to measure the end and so on. And in our efforts to measure the effect of um, social capital, we, we have as our standard an arm's length uh, exchange of, of, of commodities. And so this becomes our, our standard. And if we introduce a change, such as a relationship changes, and we can look at the change in the terms and level of exchange and so on, then even though it's not a perfect measure, it provides us um, an, an, an explanation or a measure of the importance of this relationship on the terms and level of trade. Um, with regard to the measurement of cheap social capital, uh, it would probably be the same approach, although it may be a little different because when we looked at the farmland studies, we had, um, there was never hardly any exchanges between um, the, the seller and the buyer who was a nasty neighbor. Yet uh, they did provide some premiums that the nasty neighbor would have to pay in order to acquire the land. So, yes, I think it can be measured. I think we have to establish a standard and a very carefully controlled study. But uh, for much of my career, I've studied risk. And uh, it's not uncommon to measure risk against the standard of risk-free. So we have a risk-free environment. We introduce variability in a certainty and measure the consequence. So I don't see that the principles for measuring the consequences of cheap social capital would be any different. I think as a sociologist, I would, I would probably, my instinct would be, first of all, to go and measure sympathy. Um, basically to ask people how they felt about other people. But uh, that seems to have a whole range of, of complexities and difficulties. And, and maybe it's something that is ultimately not really observable because people aren't really conscious of their sympathies towards others. Um, and there's, there are things that are, are really quite highly changeable as well. So maybe the, the sociological approach to measurement is, is really quite, uh, has a lot of difficulties, I think. Could, could very well be. I mean, I don't think, I don't know if we can really measure sympathy, but we can measure what it produces and we can measure the, the consequences, what something that we can observe that all we, we could all agree on, okay, this measurement was, was observed and, and uh, it might be very difficult to compare someone's love for their neighbor versus my love for my neighbor or something like that. Right, yeah, yeah, precisely. Uh, if you're even really aware of, of the extent of those, those feelings as well, because a lot of these things, I think, are basically pre-reflective. You know, they're the predispositions that we may not really understand until we, we come to act or we reflect on them deeply. So um, one comment in response to um, Julie Tabor, uh, Taylor, who is a wonderful friend and has helped in so many ways, uh, noted the similarity between social identity theory and our discussion on commonalities. And I think that's a very important, uh, uh, if, if, if you're interested in pursuing this idea of, of commonalities, uh, that's, that's a really a great literature to turn to. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think there's some really interesting work being done on social identity and social capital. 
um, particularly Evangelos Tontos from um, Open University, I think is doing some really interesting work on that in that space. Um, and I think that psychology and social psychology generally is, a, is an area that has been a bit underexplored in social capital. And I'd really love to see more work done in, in, within that discipline. So perhaps a related idea is, I mean, we all have lots of commonalities. Some of them are important and others aren't. For example, we're all in a, in a phone book someplace, I suppose, but it's not very important. And, um, but it's when this commonality leads to an exchange of um, social emotional goods or relational goods, does that commonality become a source of social capital? And um, so going back to this uh, book on tribes, an intense experience like, like two people might experience in a, in a war setting are intense and, uh, and, and could easily lead to a very, a very important uh, kind of social capital, even bonding social capital to some extent. And perhaps there's one other kind of um, comment I would make about this exchange of relational goods. If, if I go to the gas station and I pay my money and I receive my gas, there's, no, there's hardly any after effect of that transaction on future choices. I mean, it's just done, it's over. But um, if I make an investment in a, in a new machinery or equipment or other kinds of things, um, that's likely to affect my choices and investments and production decisions down the road. Um, and the same sort of analogy applies to social capital. If I have an experience where I either exchange social emotional goods or relational goods or relational bads. That affects my social capital and is likely to alter my transactions down in the future. So uh, in, uh, not too long ago, my wife and I attended or uh, went to an eating place and it was just horrible. Everything about it was, uh, was unpleasant. And, um, and we said to each other as we walked out the door, we will never come back here again. This will never be. Um, and so that one experience had sort of an after effect. It was, it all, it's altered our choices for a long time. So, so it's very important, this, this question of exchanging relational goods or bads. Absolutely. So should we move on to the next question, Marion, who would that be? Uh, well, I don't know who the, what the J stands for, but uh, Jay Riverside has a question that, uh, about pure trade-offs. I might like to talk to that one in this context. Yep. Off you go. Could it be that a trade-off constitutes a, a case of cheap social capital? To the extent of it doesn't, Im it doesn't imply trust beyond transaction. Is that, have I got that right? Might be having trouble getting through. Anyway, okay. All right. Uh, I, I would like to, to respond to that though, if, if, it, yeah, if we're yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. So um, if, I, if I pull into a town I've never visited and there's an establishment, um, that uh, never heard of, uh, I, I may be a little uncertain about uh, exchanging uh, money for a meal. But if I, if I attend, if I happen to see sort of a, um, oh, a McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, the, and I say, well, that may not be my first choice of a meal, but generally speaking, I, I can accept the, that this company has established over time a set of accepted rules and cleanliness practices and so on. And their brand has this certain kind of attachment value that I value and will influence my decision. So, um, you know, ob obviously uh, we can also do that with a personal connection exchanging, but this brand turns out to be a high attachment value good that enables exchanges that might not ordinarily occur. 
And uh, one of the examples of, of cheap social capital is that the Swedish company H&M uh, uh, criticized the Ungers in, in uh, the treatment of the Ungers in China. And as a result, their brand was uh, really um, made less accessible and they suffered other disadvantages. And so one example of how we manifest cheap social capital is to destroy the brand of our competitor or even the reputation of someone we don't like. So brands are a very important element of, cheap, of social capital and cheap social capital. Oh, great, should we move on? Next question. Sorry, Marion, you're muted. Trying not to make more. Uh, we go to Miss Sunny next. Who's also, oh. Hi. Yeah. Okay, so hello, thank you for taking my question and Professor, thank you so much for being here. This has been tremendously informative. Um, I'm actually studying uh, the social capital development at the elementary, middle and high school levels uh, because I think it, I, I didn't even realize social capital was a thing about 10 years ago when I, when I was working on basically what has become a lifelong project. Um, but I was wondering what thoughts you might have on how to refrain from developing that negative, that 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 costly social capital, because really, what high, I see in, in especially high school, which is my focus, um, in high school level, we have um, easy vilification of certain kids. Uh, we call it the school to school to prison pipeline. Uh, there's a lot. Of, you, you probably know a lot about what what happens in public schools in the United States, specifically considering that you're here with us. Um, what, what thoughts might you have uh, just in general? I, I just wanna hear where you, where you land on the costs of social capital or the negative social capital at the, for the little ones. Well, a great question. Um, and of course, uh, James Coleman wrote his famous article about development of human capital using social capital. So uh, really since the beginning, we've recognized that um, social capital has an important role in the education establishment. If you make, if you create attachment value for learning from someone who is in the social capital position, you can change the, the course of a, of a student's life forever. And um, so, so we, uh, we recognize that. The, we also recognize that, as you have said, that cheap social capital is cheap. In, um, I can easily try and gain popularity in a school setting by vilifying or picking on, bullying, discriminating, whatever you want to call it. Um, another student is just a cheap form. And so in our earlier discussion, we talked about what can we do to mitigate it? And I think one of the things that we can do to mitigate uh, cheap social capital in the classroom is to bring it out into the open. Um, to, to make sure that we recognize what this action is all about. It's all about trying to gain some advantage by creating cheap social capital and maybe emphasizing the advantages of cooperating. So historically, um, uh, schools have done several things to try to build cheap social capital. One, which we might not agree to now, is wearing the same uniform. So if, I, if we all go to school and we're dressed alike or we're, we have similar interests, this perhaps goes to some distance to saying, well, I'm, you know, your clothes are better than mine or, or I can distinguish myself from you by the clothes I wear. And of course, um, just simply how we organize schools is an important element in this concept. Uh, if I organize my schooling based on some exclusionary criteria, such as the price of admission, uh, the religion of students, the um, sort of the political views of the families, where you live, and so on, um, that can be a real barrier. And so to have uh, schools organized with a, with, with a cross-section of students allows people to sort of later in life be able to come to the conclusion, you know what, we are more similar than we thought. 
uh, for years, I took students from uh, Michigan State University to different countries and study abroad. And uh, in our program, they would live with host families. And it wasn't, um, it, it, it took such a short time for the students living with these families to recognize that they were just like each other. But they went to the same thing, they enjoyed similar events and so on. So what do we have in our public school system? Public meaning you can organize across a lot of uh, diverse lines that would create um, a commonality which would bind the students together. And sometimes that can be organized around a service project, um, in, in introducing families, having parents come in and talk about their background. Almost any effort you can do to build a commonality that will create a basis for developing social capital. And when students find that they appreciate the, this shared background, they're less likely to rely on um, cheap social capital as a way of making themselves popular. Great question, thank you. <laughs> great question and great response as well. That was, that was fascinating. Should we move on next question, Erin? Uh, yeah, McKillary is, is next. So McKillary, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question or we can ask it on your behalf if you'd prefer. Give him a, a moment to unmute. Yeah, I did send a message saying you're up next. <laughs> um, Mar Marion, do you want to read it out? Uh, yes, I'm just trying to go back to it. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, in some in some Christian religious organisations, and there's a similar question to this later. So you're actually answering two questions, often referred to as cults by some psychologists. Um, yep. Okay, this is okay. By some psychologists, they have policies in the practice of excommunicating, cutting off, um, and shunning members who dare to ask authorities thinking questions, etc. Is this uh, um, is this an example of what you're talking about? So, uh, you know, banning religious people from cults, I think, is the, is the question there. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the, uh, the role of religion in creating cheap social capital has a long and unfortunate history. It mm. also has a long and unfortunate history of creating social capital, of providing service and uniting people around common um, um, you know, common themes, common values, and so on. Um, every organization is going to have its membership criteria. To be a member, if you're a member of a Lions Club or a religious group, they're going to have a, uh, a set of criteria for membership to distinguish us from them. So the really heart of this question, and really in the real essence of it, is the advantage of having a social capital network established around enforceable criteria offset by, uh, by having exchange, by creating cheap social capital or referring to the dark side of social capital uh, by those that are excluded, that want to be, that aren't, aren't willing to adopt the um, the standards or the criteria of the organization. And, and of course, there's, this is a very nuanced question. I mean, um, one of our famous comedians said, uh, I would never belong to a club that would accept me as a member. And so, um, you know, uh, if, if, if we don't accept the, the standards, you know, would we really want to belong? And, and again, yes, perhaps I would. And so the question of establishing inclusive and exclusive means, uh, you know, and these can be quite harsh. Uh, and, and of course, there are all kinds of measures that can be used to discriminate, not just 
club membership or religious memberships, but uh, racial discrimination, age discrimination, you know, this whole, whole idea of, of excluding people from the social, social, uh, a social capital network is really, unfortunately, the great examples of the dark side of social capital. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it also relates to, to politics as well, that quite often somebody who is in a, politi a certain political position, when they, they leave or they've been removed, they can often be vilified uh, for the role that they played in that. And that seems to be mobilizing cheap social capital to, to create more solidarity within the political party against the person who, who has left, particularly if that person wasn't particularly supportive or was acting in some way that was undermining the, the solidarity of the group. And think of some examples within um, US politics of late that might be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, should we move on to the next question? Who would that be, Marion? Yep, fascinating. Organisational politics too, don't forget Tristan. Absolutely. Um, I'm handing over, we're handing over to John Delaney. Yes, and I apologize, my wording in what I uh, entered in the chat was um, without a lot of premeditated thought. What I probably answered in my own mind is that uh, when we speak about cheap social capital, we're not necessarily speaking about uh, thin social capital or thin trust. Uh, but we, we do seem to get ourselves in trouble. That's my observation when we try to maintain social capital light all the time. Uh, you know, I think there's a great place for schmoozing and, and so forth and so on, but there's also a place for debate. Uh, and I'm doing the talking rather than asking a question, but uh, am I correct in that, that we need to engage in more uh, meaningful and fair debate, uh, but we can't always stay on the sidelines and engage in validation. Well, you've raised a really an important point. And, um, you know, I think if we could know when to engage and when not to, we could solve a lot of problems. Um, to the first point on thin social capital and thick social capital, in, in my mind, that perhaps relates to social capital that arises from earned commonalities. We work at the same place, we meet each other uh, going to work and so on. It's mostly transactional. Um, it, it, it's unlikely to result in, in, in an important exchange of relational good versus uh, being member of the family or, or uh, some other really being married, uh, sharing a lot of uh, having common relatives and so on becomes a more important part. And um, so, but, but now you come to really what I think is the heart of your question. And that is, what if we're in a transaction where, um, you know, we're not going to be smoothing, but, you know, I like smoothing. I don't, don't underestimate the value of smoothing, but um, but we, we have a legitimate conflict. You want to put a road through my property and I don't want you to, or you want to build in something in my backyard or your music is too loud. In other words, what do we do when we, we have a commonality that is not going to lead to uh, social capital? I mean, you know, we have a commonality. We're listening to the same loud music, but that doesn't mean that's going to make us uh, you know, build our social capital. And so um, how do we deal with those kind of exchanges without, um, you know, without producing really deep, cheap social capital and so on. And, um, uh, and I have a friend who, who made kind of a, a sexist joke, but he said, always lather before you shave. If you're, you know, if you're, if we're going to have a conflict, can't we precede that with, with finding something on which we can have an exchange of relational goods? But yet we still at some point have to talk about the essence of our conflict, that, hey, your music is too loud. And if we can't agree, we're likely to refer it back to some kind of formal institution, a, a city ordinance, um, 
you know, a, a neighborhood association uh, uh, bylaws and so on. It's better if we can work it out between us, but in some cases we simply can't. We simply have a conflict. Thank you, sir. Who's, who's next? I think we've got time for maybe just a couple more questions. Um, so uh, we've we... got Tristan and then I think Shirley's asked a question. Um, Julie, over to you on social identity. I didn't have a question. Thank you. I think Julie's was maybe more of a comment. So was it? Uh, yeah, OK. Move on to the next one. Um, all right. Uh, well, Shirley asked about uh, tight connections. So, Shirley, did you want to ask your questions? Yes, thank you very much. And um, this has been fascinating, and I'm really enjoying it. And glad I got up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm interested in the the idea of cheap social capital and how that fits with something you alluded to earlier about the tight connections within groups. And, and how that can exclude as well as include. And I'm not sure that I've made it as clear as I might have. So if you think of a group and uh, as establishing membership criteria, what they're really saying is members of this group will have adherence to these criteria or these characteristics in common. And they form the basis of building um, uh, earn social capital or, or uh, linking social capital as we, we like to call it. But immediately what you do when you establish those criteria for membership and even rules for uh, excluding members, you've created a group of people who are not eligible or interested in joining. You've excluded them. Now, if you're the only game in town, that's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. and, and, and very hurtful, but hopefully there are enough diversity of groups and interests that um, we can find a place where we fit, we can enjoy the benefits of a social capital network, um, and we don't make the dividing line between us and them so important that we can't interact outside of the activities of our, our organization or, or group. In other words, just because um, me and my neighbor are um, members of the Rotary Club doesn't mean we can't go to church together or attend our school, our children's school activities together and share relational goods. As long as the, as the requirements don't exclude you from participating and sharing and building commonalities in other areas, then they're probably less harmful. They, they can be beneficial. But if you say any person with this ethnic background or gender or so on is excluded from this network, that's when it becomes really harmful. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Shirley? Yeah. All right, next question, Marion. Uh, yes, I, I, Langley's actually asked a fascinating question, but um, hasn't responded whether or not wants to ask it. So um, she says, me, uh, Miss Sunny makes a good point. Evolutionary psychologists also make uh, we humans are inherently a negative, but have a negative bias. So we are hardwired to notice threats. Um, or the bad. It seems it would take extra effort to overcome this natural bias to create cheap social capital. Uh, perhaps the service component you mentioned could help. So if Langley's there, wants to. Sorry, yes. I, I, I was just making a comment. I guess it sort of answered, you already answered that. I think. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, apart from that, Marcelo has a question, I think. Next. Yeah, Marcelo, would you like to answer that, ask that question? Yep. Yes. Uh, today, the council approach or council, uh, the council approach, especially within the social media, is another form of cheap social capital or how it's related to cheap social capital? 
Is, is this the like term cancel culture that's being used a lot? Yeah, the, yeah, the cancel culture, yes. Um, Tristan, I think you ought to take a swing at this one. <laughs> yeah, sure can. Um, so I think um, labeling something as cancel culture to me seems like it's a way to um, deflect um, any kind of responsibility or, or any need to address the issue and to make an other um, of, of those people, of, of that issue. So to me, it is absolutely an example of, of cheap social capital and a way, a way in which cheap social capital can be reinforced um, by, by the beliefs of, of the group. Um, Lyndon, what do you think? I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay. it, it's such, a, such an important and such an interesting topic, cancel culture, um, and something that is so, so prevalent. And I think we see a lot of other examples of things being simply labelled in a way to dismiss them altogether, um, and often incorrectly labelled. You know, that's Antifa. Um, that's, that's terrorism, you know, when it may or may not really be terrorism, but it's a way to, to put it in a particular box and, and create, I think, really some, some cheap social capital. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, if the whole point of um, creating cheap social capital is uh, emphasizing the difference between me and you, and uh, I'm good and you're not. And so if we can uh, create a, 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 a sort of and label and put people in a category different from ourselves, we absolutely are investing in cheap social capital. And, and really re, re increasing the stability of our cheap social capital network, because if you want to maintain a cheap social capital network, the last thing you want to happen is exchanges between your object and other members of your network in which they might overcome their, or, or learn about each other and develop commonalities. Yeah. Marcelo, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, it seems like a very big topic we, we could explore for a long time. But any any little thoughts? No, I, I agree with both of you. This is a clear example of uh, cheap social capital. Okay, absolutely. Nice to see you, Marcelo. I should say that uh, Marcelo was uh, was a uh, uh, colleague, and we have spent years and years together working on social capital related issue, and a great friend. Absolutely. So I think we've just about run out of time, but. Um, one final question, um, Lyndon, for you. How would you summarize going forward the, the key areas, the key focus of research? Like, where would you like to see investigation go in relation to cheap social capital? If you could set an agenda for other researchers to pick this up. Well, I can only reflect on what I would do if I had 10 more years in my profession. And um, I, I suppose the first thing that I would do is really um, um, emphasize the consequences of cheap social capital. I think one of the things that helped uh, us in our, as we tried to begin our efforts in social capital was to demonstrate how important it was getting uh, loans approved Cheap, uh, social capital was extremely important. Um, the terms of trade for farmland, how uh, decisions of people to get medical screens, um, starting wages of people with disabilities. We just go through application and application until we, we sort of connect with enough different groups that we're not fighting the battle alone, that we've said, um, yes, we have... Um, this is important for what I'm doing. And um, so the, our scientific community requires evidence. And we've introduced the concept today and, and said, uh, gave some examples that others might dispute and say, no, I can explain it in some other way. Um, so we need evidence. We need evidence and, and some controlled experiments and sort of uh, things that will stand on their own in the scientific community that will then uh, uh, lead others to say, yes, this is an important and, and a scientifically acceptable concept. 
So could we make the PowerPoint slides from today available to the audience? Of course. And, and in there, there's, there's a range of research questions related to the observation. So there's a, a lot of ideas there you might like, other people might like to take up and, and move forward with. So I, th I think at this point, we'll wrap up the main um, part of, of the session. Uh, we'll have a couple of breakout rooms in a moment for small group discussion. Um, but I'll release everybody. No one needs to stay any longer. And I really want to thank uh, Lyndon for, for you taking the time to, to engage with the group and share your knowledge and expertise. Um, it's been really wonderful having you on board. Thank you very much. And wonderful to be here, Tristan. So I'll, I'll stop the recording now. Um, everyone, you're welcome to stay, Lyndon, and of course, everybody else. Uh, Marion's going to set up some, some breakout rooms, uh, which will just take a moment for that to happen. Um, Marion, do you want to give some details of that? Uh, yeah, just two breakout rooms in that.